you can see the hash for the block you can see the height of the block meaning the number of blocks so this right here is the 237 uh, 32nd 232nd 32,000 this right here is the 232nd thousand fifty third block to have been produced and then we can take a look at the prior block and, and this one was constructed in Germany and this one right here the it was constructed somewhere on the East Coast in Massachusetts it's kind of a really amazing thing to be able to see and we can see the slush pool that was in Germany 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 I guess there's a lot of German blocks in the network but um, what you should take from this is that not only are we able to verify transactions and and understand that the money you spent you've had the right to spend we actually as a result of the blockchain can vet every transaction since the very beginning of the block of the Bitcoin this is currently impossible with any normal money there is no way with the US dollar that one can take an arbitrary dollar and since when it was put into circulation know every single location it's ever arrived at in fact there have been attempts by the Treasury Department to just track a couple of dollars that have flown through circulation and it turned out to be nearly impossible they lost most of the dollars and only a few percentage points of them ever managed to, to complete a, a large enough journey for them to record it and get good data because some dollars just disappeared some dollars were destroyed the blockchain is amazing in that if a Bitcoin is created for the rest of the Bitcoin's existence we'll know where it's at and we'll know what accounts have received it even though we don't know the identities of the people who have received it so you can have your anonymity and also have great statistics at the same time blockchain is really an amazing thing think of the blockchain as basically a ledger that's that's all you really need to know it's basically a giant gigantic book it's right now 6.5 gigabytes the maximum size it can grow per year is 48 gigabytes generally it grows about one to two gigabytes per year uh, currently people can install uh, can download and actually analyze the entire blockchain on their computer over time it'll become more cumbersome especially as the transaction volume picks up but the all intensive purposes the blockchain is just a giant book that you can look through and understand where the coins are and verify who owns what and everybody has a copy of it. The blockchain size and complexity prevents anyone from attempting to counterfeit transactions. I mentioned in a prior lecture the 51 percent attack. So it is conceivable that if someone gained 51 percent of the computing power of the Bitcoin network they would be able because of the way these math problems work this proof of work is done to actually counterfeit coins and cause other shenanigans. But I'm going to give you an idea of how much computer power is necessary to be able to get 51% of the Bitcoin network. So this is as of November of 2012, the list of the most powerful supercomputers on the planet. So right here at uh, the Department of Energy uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, there's Titan, which was a half billion dollar, incredibly expensive, massive multi-megawatt supercomputer. It took years to build, it took lots of planning, uh, tons of scientists and, and really remarkably smart people and this thing is used to do stuff like weather calculations, it's used to to model nuclear explosions, it's it's amazing complex and it's uh, all the stuff it does is classified because it's in a secret government lab. And you can see there's one in the United States, there's one in Japan, there's one in China and Italy but you can see all of these guys they're around 27,000 teraflops, 20,000 teraflops, 11,000 teraflops and so forth. I'm going to convert this to petaflops for you uh, because the next statistic I'm going to bring up is going to become relevant. A petaflop is a thousand teraflops so the overall power of this computer somewhere between 17 and 27 petaflops and it has 560,000 computer processors in it. It's a pretty amazing thing. Okay. So now let's take a look at how much total processing power is in the Bitcoin network. So here's Bitcoin Watch. Currently, 818 petaflops. Let's look back here, 27 petaflops for the most powerful computer on the planet.
20 petaflops for the second most powerful, 11 for the third most powerful, and so forth. The Bitcoin network is 818 petaflops. You need 51% of that processing power to be able to cause problems to it. So you'd need over 400 petaflops of processing power. If you were to add up everything on this list, the top 10 most powerful supercomputers in the world, one's in China, one's in Italy, several in Germany, and so forth, you wouldn't even be able to touch it. You wouldn't even be able to get 51% of the computing power of the uh, of the Bitcoin that you would need a, to rebuild the blockchain in a way that could cause problems. So this is why when people say the Bitcoin is computationally secure, even with the most powerful supercomputers on the planet at this point, it is physically impossible to go ahead and rig the blockchain to do things like have illegitimate transactions or counterfeit transactions or steal money and so forth. So computationally speaking, the Bitcoin is more secure than probably anything else on the planet. And using the right software, one can verify transactions very quickly and very easily. All right, so now we know what mining is and now we understand what a block is and we understand what the blockchain is. How do you actually mine? What do you need to do it? You need hardware. And so generally when the first Genesis block was created, Satoshi Nakamoto used a processor, used an Intel processor to go ahead and mine a block. Okay? And the difficulty rate was sufficiently low at the time that he was able to do this very quickly. He could generate lots of blocks because he wanted to go ahead and get some Bitcoins into circulation. Then as the difficulty ratcheted up, it became more and more difficult. And over time, people realized that they could use graphics cards using OpenCL and um, CUDA to mine Bitcoin significantly faster than they could on computer processors. So now Bitcoin mining is mostly done with graphics cards, the most popular AMD cards. And I, uh, I have a website here that actually lists the speed of mining with graphics cards and CPUs. So if you look at a couple of graphics cards, and these are all AMD cards, here's the model 57070, uh, that's 212 mega hashes, and the card that I actually have in my computer is the 7970. Let's go find it on the list. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. Uh, 7950, excuse me. Yeah, so right here, 510 mega hashes. And that's about what I'm getting. So let's compare that to some computer processors. Okay, so here are some AMD CPUs. The computer processor that I'm currently using is an AMD Phenom X6 1100T. And I can get about 22 mega flops, uh, 22 mega hashes, compared to my graphics card, which gets over 500. And you can see the Intel chips do not fare much better either. So this kind of gives you an idea that um, if you're going to be mining bitcoins, you're probably going to have to do it on a graphics card. In fact, you can't make any money doing it on a uh, computer processor. It would cost you more money in power than the amount of bitcoins you'd produce. As of 2013, we've also started to witness highly specialized hardware called fuel programmable grid arrays and also application specific integrated circuits, which have been basically designed from the ground up to outperform graphics processing units, those graphics cards. So even though graphics cards are great and they're incredibly fast and they can do amazing things much faster than computer processors can, certain things, uh, FPGAs and ASICs can even compute these hashes at a much greater rate in the giga hashes. In fact, we're starting to see ASICs enter the market, which are 5 to 50 giga hashes in processing power for a single ASIC. Whereas the best graphics card on the market, the um, 7990 from AMD, is about 800 mega hashes to a giga hash. So some of these ASICs are 25 to 50 times faster and consume less power. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool to see that people are now starting to build hardware from the ground up just to mine bitcoins. Remember that mining is only profitable when you can recruit both the initial hardware cost and the power spent making bitcoins. To make this a bit more clear, I'm going to open up a bitcoin calculator. This is one of the ASIC miners I mentioned. Open up a bitcoin calculator and let's go ahead and pick something off the list. So let's say that you're going to mine with your computer processor. Okay, let's say you have a Core i7-2600K. Okay, and that's 6.7 mega hashes of power. 
So let's go ahead and enter that in. If you were to mine for an entire month, right now you would make about a dollar thirty at the current exchange rate, which is let's find out. $115 per coin. Okay, so you would make, I guess it was right there too. Dumb, dumb me. Okay, so if you're using a really powerful computer processor, you would only be making a dollar thirty. And remember, you'd have to run it for an entire month, and you'd be eating about 10 cents worth of power per an hour to 20 cents, depending upon where you live. So, uh, you know, if on the low end, you'd be spending $2.40 a day on power. On the high end, you'd be spending uh, about five bucks a day in power, and you'd have to do that for an entire month. You use about $150 worth of power. All right, so the graphics card I have runs at 500 mega hashes. And minus power, I'm making about $100 per month. So if I can find a way to get power cheaply, or maybe I have solar or something, I can actually make a hefty profit. This device right here that they're advertising runs at 50,000 mega hashes. You can see it generates $10,000 worth of Bitcoins every single month. Now, this is a bit deceptive. Remember that I said that we want Bitcoins to be produced roughly every 10 minutes. So when many of these guys enter the market, as they have been, what's going to happen is that the difficulty will ratchet up so that we have to spend more giga hashes to go ahead and produce uh, the same amount of Bitcoins. Thus, this number will be reduced considerably as more of these guys enter in. But if you're an early adopter and you happen to have access to the hardware and your competition are graphics cards, just like when everybody was mining on their CPUs and the competition were graphics cards, uh, you will make this kind of money, but very quickly you'll make considerably less. It's going to probably look more like this, which is still a respectable amount. Okay, so we have this notion of a mining pool. You've probably heard of it, and let's talk about it right now. Remember that the Bitcoin is a lottery system. Okay, so when somebody wins the lottery, the lottery people don't get together and say, well, this guy bought 10,000 lottery tickets, so he should get the largest share of the lottery. And this guy bought 5,000 lottery tickets, so he should get the second largest share. It's a winner takes all. So even though you may have purchased one ticket and somebody bought a million tickets, you, if you hit the numbers and that person did not, will win the entire jackpot. And the Bitcoin is exactly the same way. When someone wins a block, they win a block outright. The coins are not divided. It goes straight to their address, and it's theirs. End of story. So this is slightly problematic, because let's say you buy all this really expensive mining equipment, and you have giga hashes of processing power. You're still competing with petahashes of processing power inside the overall Bitcoin cluster, which basically means your probability of discovering this solution first at random is very, very low. So at some arbitrary point, maybe in a year or two of operation, you'll get a block of 25 Bitcoins. You'll be that lucky winner of the lottery, but not often. And this is just like in real life when people have lottery pools. So they say, my chances alone of winning the lottery are very low, but if I pool together with lots of people, it increases my chances. But then you have to trust that whoever is in charge of the pool is going to distribute the winnings. So the mining pools were created basically to combine massive sets of computers together so that the probability of these computers collectively finding that solution is very high. And in exchange, you get an equal division for the work that you've put in minus an operator cost. Pool operators generally take about 2 to 5%, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. It depends on a lot of features and factors. But the notion is that they share money in accordance with the work that people have done for the pool. So here's a list of.